First day of summer vacation, a hot, sticky afternoon in June. I challenged my older sister Minnie to a ping pong game. Ladies and gentlemen, she's in her serve position. She's a little bit nervous. She's got a big green glob hanging out of her nose. Minnie just ignored me, tapping the ball over the net. I dove forward and whacked it with the tip of my paddle. Spinning high over the net, it landed in the corner of the basement, right between the washing machine and the dryer. Mindy ran after it. Hey, where's Buster? Wasn't he sleeping next to the dryer? Buster is our dog, a giant black Rottweiler with a head the size of a basketball. Everyone is afraid of Buster for about three seconds. Then he starts licking them with his long, wet tongue or rolls onto his back and begs to have his belly scratched. Where is he, Joe? He's around here somewhere. Why are you always worrying about Buster? He weighs over 100 pounds. He can definitely take care of himself. Not if Mr. McCall catches him. Mr. McCall is our next door neighbor. Buster loves the McCall's yard. He loves to nap under their huge shady elm tree and dig little holes all over their lawn and snack in their vegetable garden. You see, my dad and Mr. McCall are the two best gardeners in town. They're nuts about gardening. They're always battling it out at the annual garden show. Mr. McCall usually takes first place, but last year, Dad and I won the blue ribbon for our tomatoes. That drove Mr. McCall crazy. So Mr. McCall is desperate to win this year. He started stocking up on plant food and bug spray months ago, and he planted something that nobody else in North Bay grows. Strange orange-green melons called cassabas. Whose serve is it? It's still my serve. Oh, who is that? Oh no, it's Mr. McCall. Joe! The floor shook as he stomped toward Mindy. All the color drained from her face, and Mindy's hand grasped her paddle so tight that her knuckles turned white. McCall's hands were balled into huge fists, and he looked really, really angry. I'm gonna get you! <laughs> and this time I'm gonna win. Throw me a paddle, come on! You jerk! Gotcha! <laughs> Moose is Mr. McCall's son and my best friend. His real name is Michael, but everyone calls him Moose. I think he's cool. Yo, Joe, come on, where's my paddle? His big arm muscles bulged as he reached out to grab mine. I pulled my hand back, but his beefy hand slapped my shoulder so hard that my head nearly rolled off. Ugh. Oh, you guys are totally juvenile. I'm out of here. Oh, no! Nice try. There's nothing out there. I'm not falling for your lame trick. No, it's Buster. Oh, he's next door again. Oh, wow. He's in the garden again. My garden? He better not be. If my dad catches Buster and his vegetables, he'll turn that big mutt into mulch. Oh, come on. Hurry. We have to get Buster out of there. Right away before Moose's dad catches him. Moose, Minnie, and I raced outside, leaping across the line of yellow and white petunias that separates our yard from the McCall's garden. Buster's digging. Oh, no. He's going to destroy the melons. Stop that, Buster! Stop that! Now! Buster kept digging. Moose glanced at his plastic wristwatch. You better get that dog out of there fast. It's almost six o'clock. My dad comes out to water the garden at six sharp. I'm afraid of Mr. McCall. I admit it. He is so big. He makes Moose look like a shrimp. And he's mean. Joe, don't just stand there. Pull that dumb mutt out of there. We can't. He's too big and stubborn. He won't budge. I reached under my t-shirt and searched for the shiny metal dog whistle I wear on a cord around my neck. I wear it day and night. It's the only thing Buster will obey. It's two minutes to six. Dad will be out here any second. Blow the whistle, Joe! I brought the whistle up to my mouth and gave a long, hard blow. 
The whistle's broken. It didn't make a sound. It's a dog whistle. It makes a really high-pitched sound that dogs can hear, but people can't. 30 seconds and counting. I blew the silent dog whistle one more time. Yes! Buster came trotting slowly toward us, wagging his stumpy tail. Hurry, Buster! Hurry! Run! Don't trot! Too late! We heard a loud slam. Moose's front door flew open, and Mr. McCall stepped out. Joe, get over here, boy, on the double. Mr. McCall lumbered toward his garden, his big belly bouncing in front of him under his blue t-shirt. He's retired from the army, used to barking orders and having them obeyed. I obeyed. Buster trotted by my side. Was that dog in my garden again? No, no, sir. I usually don't tell lies, <laughs> except to Mindy. But Buster's life was on the line. If that mutt wasn't in here, why is this dirt all dug up? Maybe it was the wind? Um, um, Mr. McCall, we'll make sure Buster stays out of your yard. We promise. Then Mindy smiled her sweetest smile. Oh, all right. But if I catch him even sniffing at my melons, I'm calling the police and having that dog hauled off to the pound. And I mean it. I gulped. I knew he meant it. Mr. McCall doesn't kid around. Moose, bring the hose out here and water these cassavas. I told you they needed to be watered at least five times a day. See you later, Joe. Mindy looked at me and rolled her eyes. Maybe it was the wind? Well, that was fast thinking, Joe. Oh, yeah? Well, at least I had an answer. And remember, it was my whistle that saved Buster. All you did was smile that phony smile. Minnie and I headed toward our house, but we stopped when we heard a low moan. Who's that? A second later, we found out. Dad lurched around the side of the house, carrying a big watering can, and he was moaning, which was really weird, because Dad is always in an excellent mood when he's gardening, but not today. Today, something was wrong, really wrong. Oh, kids, kids, I've been looking for you. Dad, what is it? What's wrong? Dad clutched his head and swayed from side to side. He took a deep breath. Oh, I, I have something terrible to tell you. What, Dad? Tell us. I found a fruit fly on our tomatoes, on our biggest tomato. The Red Queen. How could this happen? I missed it. I sprayed. I pruned twice this week alone. Oh, my poor tomatoes. If that fruit fly ruins my Red Queen, I'll, I'll have to pull out of the garden show. Mindy and I glanced at each other. I knew we were thinking the same thing. The adults around here were getting a little weird. Dad, it's only one fruit fly. It only takes one, Joe. Just one fruit fly and our chances for a blue ribbon destroyed. We have to do something right away. What about that new bug spray? That stuff that came last week from the Green Thumb catalog. The bug be gone. Come on, kids. Oh, let's give it a try. Mindy and I raced after Dad as he jogged up the driveway to the garage. He pulled out three spray cans. The words, wave bye-bye to bugs with bug be gone, were printed on the labels. Dad handed one can to Mindy and one to me as we followed him out to the garden. One, two, three, let's get that fruit fly. <laughs> with all the hooping and hollering, my mom stepped out of the back door to see what all the fuss was about. <clears throat> oh, uh, hi, honey. Uh, we're about to destroy a fruit fly. Want to watch? <laughs> Pretty tempting. But I have to finish a greeting card design. You guys. Mom is a graphic artist. She has an office on the second floor of our house. She can draw the most incredible pictures on her computer. Dinner at 7.30, everybody, okay? Sounds good. Okay, kids, let's finish spraying. Dad and I showered the two dozen tomato plants tied to wooden stakes in the middle of the garden. Mindy squinted, aimed the nozzle of her can directly at the Red Queen, and let out a single neat drizzle. One tiny fruit fly flapped its wings weakly and fell to the ground. Mindy smiled in satisfaction. 
Oh, good work. I think this calls for a celebration. I have the perfect idea. A quick visit to Lawn Lovely. Oh, no. Lawn Lovely is a store two blocks from our house. It's the place where Dad buys his lawn ornaments. A lot of lawn ornaments. Dad is as nuts about lawn ornaments as he is about gardening. We have so many lawn ornaments in our front yard, it's impossible to mow the lawn. Every time Dad brings a new one home, Mom threatens to toss it into the garbage. Dad, these lawn ornaments are totally embarrassing. People gawk from their cars and they take pictures of our front yard. We're a tourist attraction. Oh, please, one person took a picture. Yeah, and that picture ended up in the newspaper. It was so embarrassing. Well, I think the ornaments are cool. Someone had to defend poor Dad. Mindy just wrinkled her nose in disgust. I know it really bugs Mindy about the ornaments. It's the way Dad sticks them in the yard, without any order. If Mindy had her way, they would be lined up like her shoes in nice, neat rows. Come on, guys. Hey, let's see if a new shipment has come in. Just up the block, I spotted the tall, pointy roof of Lawn Lovely. It jutted into the sky, towering over all the houses around it. Lawn Lovely is a weird, old, three-story house set back from the street. The whole building is painted pink. The wooden floorboards on the front porch are all sagging. And there is a hole in the porch where Mr. McCall fell through last summer. As we marched past the flagpole in the front yard, I spotted Mrs. Anderson. She owns Lawn Lovely. She lives there, too. Lawn ornaments are the only thing Mrs. Anderson sells. She has hundreds of ornaments. And they're scattered all over the porch and right through the door into the first floor of the house. Hello, Lila! Mrs. Anderson didn't answer. She's a little hard of hearing. Hello, Lila. Jeffrey, how nice to see you. It's nice to see you, too. Mrs. Anderson is always nice to Dad. Mom says it's because he's her best customer. Maybe her only customer. Do you have something special in mind today? Mm, our dear is a little lonesome. I think it needs company. Really, Dad? We don't need any more lawn ornaments. Mom will be furious. Oh, a lawn, lovely lawn, always has room for one more. Right, Jeffrey? Right, Lila. Dad hurried over to a herd of wide-eyed plaster deer standing in the corner of the yard. The deer stood about four feet tall. White spots dotted their reddish-brown bodies. He studied the deer for a few seconds, and then something caught his eye. Two small gnomes standing in the middle of the lawn. Well, well, what have we here? Jeffrey, you have a wonderful eye for lawn ornaments. I knew you'd appreciate the gnomes. They were carved in Europe. Very fine work. I stared at the gnomes. They looked like little old men. They were about three feet tall and very chubby with piercing red eyes, large pointy ears, and coarse brown hair that sprouted from their heads. Their mouths curved up in wide, silly grins, and each gnome wore a bright green short sleeve shirt tied at the waist by a black belt, brown leggings, and a tall, pointy orange hat. They're terrific. Oh, kids, aren't they wonderful? They're okay, Dad. Okay? They're horrible. They're so gross. They look so, so evil. Oh, I hate them. Hey, uh, you're right, Mindy. They are pretty gross. They look, I mean, they look just like you. Uh, Joe, you are the biggest... We'll take them. Dad, no. Uh, they're hideous. Buy a deer. I mean, buy another flamingo. But not these ugly old gnomes. Uh, look at the awful colors. I mean, look at those evil grins. Oh, they're, they're just too creepy. Oh, Mindy, don't be silly. They're perfect. We'll have so much fun with them, we'll dress them as ghosts for Halloween. In Santa suits at Christmas, they'll look just like Santa's elves. Dad pulled out his credit card and started toward the pink house to complete the sale with Mrs. Anderson. Oh, these are the ugliest yet. They are completely embarrassing. I'll never be able to bring any of my friends over ever again. Mindy stomped off toward the sidewalk, but 
I couldn't take my eyes away from the gnomes. They were kind of ugly, and even though they were smiling, there was something unfriendly about their smiles. Something cold about their glassy red eyes. Whoa, Mindy, look! One of the gnomes just moved. Mindy came racing across the yard. She leaped over the flamingos and sprinted around the deer. Her face twisted in fright. That's when I lost it and burst out laughing. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> Did you really believe that a gnome grabbed me? Oh, come on. Are you totally losing it? Before she could reply, Dad jogged down the pink porch steps. Time to bring our little guys home. Oh, but let's name them first. Mindy let out a loud groan, but Dad ignored her. He patted one of the gnomes on the head. Let's call this one Hap, because he looks so happy. I'll carry Hap, you kids take... Dad stopped and squinted at the other gnome. There was a small chip on the gnome's front tooth. So, you guessed it, Dad decided to call him Chip. Then he hoisted Hap into his arms and, staggering under the gnome's weight, headed toward the driveway. Whoa, heavy. <laughs> you take Chip's feet, I'll grab the top. We struggled down the hill following Dad. Oh, everyone in the neighborhood is gawking at us. They were, too. Three girls from Mindy's school, wheeling their bikes up the hill, stopped and stared. Then they burst out laughing. <laughs> I'll never live this down. Come on, Joe, walk faster. As we neared our house, Mr. McCall spotted us trudging up the block. He stopped pruning his shrubs to admire our little parade. <laughs> More lawn ornaments, Jeffrey. Mr. McCall is mean to Minnie and me, but he and Dad get along fine. They're always kidding each other about their gardens. We lugged Chip past the McCall driveway and followed Dad into our front yard. What cheerful little guys. I've got to show your mom. She won't be able to resist them. They're too cute to hate. Yo, I hear you have some ugly new lawn things. Wow. Look at this one with the stupid grin. Way ugly. Moose leaned down and stuck his tongue out at Hap. You want to fight? You grinning shrimp. Wreck the run. Moose grabbed Hap around his waist and gave him a dozen quick punches while I closed my hands around Chip's neck and pretended to choke him. Hey, <laughs> I'll wipe that ugly grin off your face. Careful. Look, stop messing around. You're going to break them. Okay. Let's tickle them. Tickle, tickle, tickle. <laughs> You're a riot, Moose. A real... Oh, no! Buster! Moose and I spun around and spotted Buster right in the middle of Mr. McCall's garden, pawing away at the green stalks. I grabbed the dog whistle and raised it to my mouth. But before I could blow, Mr. McCall exploded out of his front door, roaring and screaming. Buster turned and trotted back to our yard his head down, his stumpy tail between his legs. Uh-oh, I thought, studying Mr. McCall's angry face. Oh, we're in for trouble now. But before Mr. McCall could start lecturing us, Dad pushed the front door open. Kids, your mother says the dinner is almost ready. Jeffrey, are you deliberately sending your mutt over to ruin my melons? Buster can't help it. He keeps mistaking your melons for golf balls. <laughs> Oh, are those tomatoes you're growing, or are they olives? <laughs> Didn't you see the tomato I rolled into the house yesterday? I had to use a wheelbarrow. <laughs> Buster danced around the yard. I think somehow he knew he had escaped big trouble. We started for the house, but I stopped when I heard a heavy thud. I turned around to discover Hap lying face down in the grass. Buster was busily licking his face. Dad was furious. Mindy held on to Buster while I grabbed the gnome by his shoulders and slowly heaved him to his feet. Then I checked for damage. Legs, arms, neck, everything seemed okay. I raised my eyes to Hap's face and jumped back in surprise. I blinked a few times and stared at the gnome once again. I, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. The gnome's smile had vanished. Its mouth stood wide open as if trying to scream. Hey. What's wrong? Is it broken? Its smile. Its smile is gone. It, lo it looks scared or something. 
See? It's unbelievable. Ha <laughs> ha! Good one, Joe. Pretty funny. I lowered my eyes to the little figure, and Hap's lips were curved up in a grin. The same silly grin he always wore. The terrified expression had disappeared. Good acting job, Joe. You really fooled us all. Maybe your son should be an actor. He didn't fool me. That one was lame. Really lame. What happened? Had I imagined that open mouth? Listen, Jeffrey, I am serious about that dog of yours. If he comes into my garden again... Mr. McCall turned to Buster and glared at him. If Buster goes over there again, I promise we'll tie him up. Aw, oh, Dad, you know Buster hates to be tied up. He hates it. Sorry, kids, that's it. Buster gets one more chance. Only one more chance, boy. Did you hear that? You only get one more chance. I woke up the next morning and squinted at the clock radio on my night table. 8 a.m. Tuesday, the second day of summer vacation. Excellent. Dad and I had an agreement, you see. If I mow the lawn once a week all summer, Dad would buy me a new bike. And I knew exactly which model I wanted, too. 21 gears and really fat tires. The coolest mountain bike ever. Anyway, I let myself out the front door and raised my face to the warm morning sun. Joe! Get over here. Mr. McCall leaned over his vegetable patch. A vein throbbed in his forehead. Oh, no, I thought as I edged toward him. What now? I've had it. If you don't tie that dog up, I'm calling the police. I mean it. Mr. McCall pointed to the ground. One of his cassava melons lay in the dirt, broken into jagged pieces. Melon seeds were scattered everywhere, and most of the orange fruit had been eaten away. Lucky for me, Dad showed up just in time. He was on his way to work. Is my son giving you some gardening advice, Bill? No jokes today. Look at what your wild dog has done. Now I have only four melons left. I warned you, Joe. I told you to keep the dog in our yard. But Buster didn't do this. He doesn't even like melons. Well, who else could have done it? Joe, I want you to tie Buster up in the back now. I could see I had no choice. I'm sorry, boy. I know you didn't eat that melon. Dad came around back to make sure I had tied the dog up. It's just as well that Buster's tied up today. The painters are starting this afternoon. Buster would only be in their way. Painters? Nobody told me that painters were coming. Oh, they're going to paint over that faded yellow. We're having the house painted white with black trim. Dad, about Buster. I have to get to work. Keep him tied up. We'll talk later. This is all Mr. McCall's fault. I stormed into the garage and grabbed the lawnmower. I pushed the mower around the side of the house and into the front yard. Mindy sat on the front steps reading. I rammed the mower forward around a flamingo. I felt like slicing off its skinny legs. I hate Mr. McCall. He is such a jerk. I'd like to smash the other four stupid melons. I'd love to wreck them all so Mr. McCall would leave us alone. Joe, get a grip. After I finished mowing, I ran into the house and grabbed a large plastic bag for the clippings. When I came back out, Moose was sprawled out across the lawn. Hey, how about a nice game of ring toss? We'll use the gnome's pointy hats. How about using Mindy's pointy head? You are so immature. Excuse me while I find some quiet place to read. Moose handed me a few rings. He flung a purple one toward Hap. The ring slid neatly around the gnome's hat. I grabbed the ring and spun around like a discus thrower. I tossed two yellow rings at Chip. They slapped against the gnome's fat face and slipped to the grass. You throw like Mindy. Watch me. Moose leaned forward and hurled two rings. They settled neatly around Chip's pointy hat. Moose flexed his bulging muscles and jumped around the yard. We tossed the rest of the rings. Moose beat me, but only by two points, 10 to eight. Rematch, Moose, let's play again. I dashed over to the gnomes and gathered up the rings. As I pulled a handful from Chip's hat, I stared into his face and gasped. What was that? A seed? An orange seed, about a half an inch long, stuck between the gnome's fat lips. Is that a melon seed? A what? A melon seed. You're seeing things, man. Come on, let's play. 
I'm not seeing things. There, right there, in Chip's mouth. Don't you see it? Yeah, I see a seed. So what? Come on. It's a cassava melon seed, Moose. Like the one scattered on the ground. How could a cassava seed find its way into Chip's mouth? There had to be an explanation. How did that seed get there? I dreamed about melons that night. I dreamed that a cassava melon grew in our front yard. Grew and grew and grew. Bigger than our house. Something startled me out of my melon dream. I fumbled for my alarm clock. Wow, oh, 1 a.m. Then I heard a howl. A low, mournful howl. I jumped out of bed and hurried to the window. I peered into the shadowy front yard. The lawn ornament stood in silence. I heard the howl again. It was Buster, my poor dog, tied up in the backyard. The house was quiet. I started down the carpeted stairs. I tiptoed through the living room into the kitchen. I heard a low, rustling sound behind me. My heart started to pound. I turned around. Nothing there. You're hearing things, I told myself. I stumbled forward in the dark and closed my hand around the doorknob. Then, two powerful hands grabbed me from behind. Where do you think you're going? Mindy, let me go. You almost gave me a heart attack. I'm going for a midnight snack. I'm going to eat the rest of Mr. McCall's stupid melons. Yum, cassabas. I need more cassabas. Joe, you better not. Hey, I'm kidding. Buster is howling like crazy. I'm just going out to calm him down. Look, if Mom and Dad catch you sneaking out in the middle of the night, it'll just take a few minutes. Mm. I'm coming. It's okay, boy. I took a step forward. Something rustled through the grass. Probably raccoons. Raccoons? That's the answer. The raccoons must have eaten Mr. McCall's melon. I wanted to wake up Dad and tell him, but I decided to wait till morning. I felt much better. That meant the Buster could be set free. I made my way over to Buster and sat next to him on the dew-wet grass. His big brown eyes drooped sadly. I threw my arms around his furry neck. Buster, I'm here. You won't be tied up for long, boy. You'll see. I'll tell Dad about the raccoons first thing in the morning. And tomorrow, I'll take you for a long walk. How's that, boy? Now go to sleep. I slipped back inside the house and jumped into bed. I felt good. I had solved the mystery of the melon. Our troubles with Mr. McCall were over, I thought. But I thought wrong. Our troubles were just beginning. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Mr. McCall's cries cut through the quiet morning, waking me from my heavy sleep. I rubbed my eyes and glanced at the clock radio. 6.30 a.m. What's all the screaming about? I hopped out of bed and hurried downstairs, yawning and stretching. Mom, Dad, and Mindy were at the front door, still in pajamas and robes. Dad, what's happening? It's Bill. Come on. We rushed outside and stared into our neighbor's garden. Mr. McCall grabbed frantically at his cassava melon, screaming. Ruined! They're totally ruined! Oh boy, we better get over there, Marion. The raccoons, I thought. They attacked the cassabas again. Gotta tell Jack, now! Before Buster gets blamed for this, too. Mr. McCall cradled his four cassava melons in his hands. They were still attached to the vine. I came out to water my cassavas, and I found this, this. Whoa, I thought when I looked at the melons. No raccoon could have done this. No way. Someone had taken a black marker and drawn big, sloppy, small faces on each melon. My sister shoved me aside to get a good look. Joe, that's horrible. How could you? What are you talking about? Yes, Mindy, what are you talking about? I caught Joe sneaking out last night, in the middle of the night. He told me he wanted to wreck the rest of the melons. Everyone turned to stare at me in horror. Even Moose, my best friend. Joe, I think you owe us an explanation. What were you doing outside in the middle of the night? I went out to calm Buster down. Dad, I was only joking when I told Mindy I wanted to wreck them. 
Well, this is no joke. You are grounded for the week. But, Dad, I, I didn't draw on those melons. Make that two weeks, and I think you should mow Mr. McCall's grass and water his garden all month as an apology. Whoa, Jeffrey. I don't want your son or your dog in my garden again, ever. And if the black stains on these melons don't come off, I'll sue, Jeffrey. Believe me. Two hours after the melon disaster, I sat in the middle of my room, grounded with nothing to do. What a totally boring day, I thought. I headed for the kitchen. Mom and the painter huddled together at the counter, checking paint swatches. We want the onyx black for the trim, not the pitch black. I think you brought the wrong paint. Mom, Buster's really bored. Can I take him for a walk? Of course not. You're grounded? Please, Buster needs a walk, and that paint smell is making me sick. Okay, okay. Take the dog. Excellent. Thanks, Mom. Good news, Buster. We're free. Buster wagged his stumpy tail. I untied the long rope and clipped a short leash to his collar. We walked about two miles, all the way down to Buttermilk Pond. On the way back to the house, we stopped at the Creamy Cow. They have the best ice cream in town. After we finished our ice cream, we continued home. Buster pulled at his leash excitedly as we strolled up the driveway. He seemed really happy to be back. He dragged me into the front yard and sniffed everything. The evergreen bushes, the flamingos, the deer, the gnomes. The gnomes? What were those dark smudges on their fingertips? Dirt? I leaned in closer. Paint. Black paint. The same color as the smiling faces on Mr. McCall's cassabas. Man, I knew I had to show somebody. Mom was in the house. She'd help me figure this out. But as I reached our front door, I heard a scraping sound coming from the McCall's yard. Buster was at it again. I shoved my hand under my t-shirt and yanked out my dog whistle, blowing it hard. Buster trotted back to me. Then he turned to lick the gnomes. I watched Buster slobber all over them. As he did, both of their mouths gaped wide open in the same terrified expressions as I'd seen before, as if they were trying to scream. My hands trembled as I quickly tied Buster to the tree. Then I ran into the house to find Mom. I found her upstairs, working in her office. Mom! Mom! You've got to come outside now! What's wrong? It's the gnomes! There's black paint on their hands, and, and they're not grinning anymore. Come out, you'll see! Joe, if this is another joke... Please, Mom! It will just take a second. It's not a joke, really! Mom led the way downstairs. She gazed at the gnomes from the front door. I was behind her. See, I told you. Look at their faces. They look like they're screaming. Joe, give me a break. Why did you get me away from work? They have the same dumb grins they always have. What? I ran outside. I stared at the gnomes. They stared back at me, grinning. Joe, honey, I really wish you'd stop the dumb gnome jokes. They're not funny. But look at the paint on their fingers. That's just dirt. Dirt. See? Dirt. Please, Joe, just go read a book or clean your room, but find something to do. You're driving me crazy. I sat down on the grass alone to think. It all added up. The gnomes are alive, I decided, and they're doing horrible things in the McCall's garden. Suddenly, I didn't feel too well. Nothing made any sense. I stood up to go inside and heard whispers, gruff whispers, down at my feet, down where the gnomes were. Not funny, Joe. Not funny at all. As we ate dinner that night, I wondered if I should tell Mom and Dad what I heard. How was everyone's day? Well, Heidi and I rode our bikes to the pool, but she got a cramp in her leg, so we mostly sunbathed. I knew they'd never believe me, but I had to tell. I heard something really weird this afternoon. Really, really weird. You interrupted me. But this is important. I was in the front yard all alone, and I heard whispers. The voices said, not funny, Joe. Not funny. I don't know who it was. Nobody was there. I, 
I, I think it was the gnomes. Enough with these gnome jokes. No one thinks they're funny, Joe. You are so lame. Please pass the bread, Dad. Dad handed Minnie the wooden tray of dinner rolls, and that was the end of that. After dinner, Dad suggested that we water the tomatoes. And I said, sure. Anything to get out of the house. Oh, no! What's wrong, Dad? What is it? He pointed silently at the tomato patch. All I could do was moan. Her beautiful red tomatoes had been crushed, mangled, and maimed. Seeds and pulpy red tomato flesh everywhere. Who would do such a terrible thing? I grabbed the sleeve of Dad's shirt and began tugging him to the front yard. The gnomes did it, Dad. You'll see. I'll prove it. Joe, let go of me. This is no time for jokes. Don't you realize that we're out of the garden show? We've lost our chance for the blue ribbon, or any ribbon for that matter. You have to believe me, Dad. Come on. I held on to Dad's sleeve, refusing to let go. As I dragged him out front, I wondered what we would find. We approached the gnomes. My eyes narrowed on the hideous creatures. Finally, we stood right before them. And I couldn't believe what we found. Turn the tape over. Unless you've got goosebumps. <laughs> Nothing. No juice. No pulp. Not a single seed. How could I have been wrong? My stomach lurched as I turned to face my dad. Dad? He cut me off with an angry wave of his hand. There's nothing to see here, Joe. I don't want to hear another word about the gnomes, understand? Not one! I know who's responsible for this, and he's not going to get away with it. He whirled around and trotted into the backyard. He scooped up a handful of smashed tomato. The juice oozed between his fingers as he circled the house and charged next door. I watched Dad march up the McCall steps and jab at the doorbell. Bill, come out here, now! I crouched behind Dad. I'd never seen him this angry before. I heard the lock turn. The door swung open, and there stood Mr. McCall in a white jogging outfit. Jeffrey, what are you yelling about? It's difficult to digest with all this noise. Well, digest this! Then he brought his hand up and hurled the smashed tomatoes. They splattered against Mr. McCall's white t-shirt and dribbled down his white sweatpants. Are you nuts? No, you are! How could you do this for a stupid blue ribbon? What are you talking about? Oh, I see! Now you're going to play innocent! You're going to pretend you don't know anything! Well, you're not going to get away with this! I didn't touch your lousy tomatoes, you wimp! You probably bought your Blue Ribbon tomatoes last year. Oh! My tomatoes were the best at the show! Yours look like raisins next to mine! And who ever heard of growing cassavas in Minnesota anyway? Why, you're going to be the joke of the garden show! Joke? You're the joke, you and your sour tomatoes and those stupid lawn ornaments. Now leave before I really lose control. Mr. McCall stomped up to his front door. And another thing, I don't want my son hanging around with Joe anymore. Your son probably wrecked your tomatoes, just like he wrecked my melons. He disappeared into the house, slamming the door so hard, the porch shook. That night, I tossed and turned in bed for hours. Faces painted on melons, crushed tomatoes, whispering lawn gnomes. I couldn't think of anything else. I rested my arms on the windowsill and peered out into the darkness. It was a foggy night. Despite the heat, I felt a chill down my back. I had never seen it this foggy before. The lawn angel slowly came into view as the fog moved away. Then the seal, the skunks, the swans, the flamingos, and there stood the deer. Alone. All alone. The gnomes were gone. 
I raced into my parents' bedroom. Mom, Dad, wake up. Wake up, the gnomes are gone! Uh, what, what? What's wrong? Hmm, what time is it, hmm? It's the gnomes. Get up, Dad, please! They're gone! They disappeared, I swear! I'm not kidding, I'm really not! Enough. We're tired of your jokes. It's the middle of the night. Get back to bed. Right now. We have had just about enough of this nonsense, and we're going to have a serious talk about this in the morning. What? Go! I backed out of the room slowly. I raced down the dark hall to Mindy's bedroom. Should I wake her up? Would she believe me? I patted her on the cheek. Mindy, wake up. Uh, Joe? Get up, quick. You have to see this. Uh, have to see what? The gnomes. The gnomes have disappeared. I think they ran away. Please, get up. Come on, please. The gnomes? Come on, Mindy, get up. It's an emergency. Emergency? What? What? What emergency? It's the gnomes. They've really disappeared. You have to come outside with me. That's the emergency? Are you crazy? I'm not going anywhere with you. You have totally lost it, Joe. Totally. But, Mindy... Quit bugging me. I'm going back to sleep. Then she closed her eyes and pulled the sheet over her head. I stood in her dark, silent room. I knew I had to do something, and fast. I ran from Mindy's room and raced down the stairs, jerked the front door open and sprinted outside. I could barely see. All shadows, nothing but shadows. Like a dream, I pushed on into the haze. I had lost all sense of direction. I heard a sound, the soft thud of footsteps. My heart was pounding, my breath was heavy. I heard a raspy cackle. A gnome? I tried to run to see it, but it grabbed me from behind, hard around the waist, and with a dry, evil laugh, it threw me to the ground. As I hit the wet ground, I heard the low, evil laugh again. And I recognized it. Moose? She scared you big time. Moose, what are you doing out here? I couldn't sleep. I kept hearing weird sounds. I was staring out in the fog, and I saw you. What are you doing out here, Joe? Causing more trouble? I haven't been causing the trouble. You've got to believe me. Look, the two lawn gnomes, they're gone. Moose could see that the gnomes weren't standing in their spots. He stared at me for a long time. This is a trick, right? No, it's real. I've got to find them. What did you do? Hide the ugly little creeps? Where are they? Come on, tell me. I didn't hide them. Moose leaned into me, bringing his face an inch from mine. Tell me or suffer the ten tortures. Stop! Stop! Get off of me! He stopped because lights flashed on in both of our houses. Oh, wow. We're in major trouble now. I heard my front door bang open. A second later, Moose's door opened too. We froze. Keep quiet. Maybe they won't see us. Who's out here? What's going on, Jeffrey? What's all the noise out here? I don't know. I thought maybe Joe was out. His voice trailed off. We're safe, I thought. We're hidden by the fog. Then I heard a low click. The long, thin beam of a flashlight swept across the yard. It landed on Moose and me. Joe, what are you doing out there? Why didn't you answer me? Moose, get in here. Move it. Moose raced into his house. I hoisted myself up from the grass and slowly made my way inside. You woke us up twice tonight, and you're outside in the middle of the night again. Oh, what's wrong with you, Joe? Listen, Dad, I only went outside because the gnomes are missing. Check, you'll see. These gnome stories are getting out of hand. I've had it. Now go upstairs before I ground you for the entire summer. Dad, I'm begging you. I've never been so serious in my life. Please look. Please! I'll never ask you for anything else again. Okay, but if this is another joke... My father stepped over to the living room window and peered out into the swirling fog. I started praying silently. Joe, you're right. 
The gnomes aren't out there. Yes. See, Dad, see, I, I was telling the truth. I wasn't joking. Hmm. Dear Lila's not there either. What? No. The deer is there. I saw it. Hold on a minute. There she is. She was hidden in the fog. And the gnomes! There they are. They're right there, too. They were hidden in the fog, too. See? I stared out the window. Two pointy hats broke through the mist. The two gnomes stood dark and still in their places beside the deer. No! I know they weren't there. I'm not playing tricks, Dad. I'm not! Joe, fog can do funny things. Why, one time I was driving through a real pea soup of a fog. I spotted something strange through the windshield. It was shiny and round, and it sort of hovered in the air. Oh, boy, I thought. A UFO. A UFO. A flying saucer. Why, I couldn't believe it. Well, my UFO turned out to be... A silver balloon tied to a parking meter. A silver balloon tied to a parking meter. Now, Joe, back to this gnome problem. I don't want to hear any more crazy stories. They are only lawn ornaments. Nothing more, okay? Not another word. Promise. What choice did I have? Promise. Then I dragged myself up the stairs to bed. What a horrible day and night. I woke up the following morning with a heavy feeling in my stomach. All I could think about were the gnomes. I peered out my bedroom window. Maybe Moose is outside helping his dad in the garden, I thought. I leaned further out the window to get a better look. Oh, no. No. There were globs of white paint splattered all over Mr. McCall's red jeep. This meant major trouble. I pulled on a pair of jeans and yesterday's t-shirt and hurried outside. I found Moose in his driveway, shaking his head as he circled the jeep. Unbelievable, huh? My dad saw this, he had a cow. Why didn't he park it in the garage? He always parks in the garage. Mom's been cleaning out the basement for a yard sale. She stuck about a million boxes of junk in the garage, so Dad had to park in the driveway last night. Moose patted the roof of the Jeep. The paint is still sticky. Touch it. I touched it. Sticky. My dad is steaming. At first he thought your dad did it. You know, because of the tomatoes. But Mom told him that was ridiculous, so he called the police. He said he won't rest until whoever did it is thrown in jail. Moose, once the police start to check things out, they're gonna blame you and me. Blame us? Are you nuts? Why would they blame us? Because we were both outside last night, and everybody knows it. You're right. What are we gonna do? I paced back and forth, thinking hard. I moved to the grass and noticed a line of small white paint spots. I knew it! I knew it! Moose, come look at this trail. The gnomes splashed your car and did all the other bad things around here. Raw gnomes? Joe, give it up. No one will believe that. Why don't you give it a rest? Check out the evidence. The melon seed on the gnomes' lips, this trail of white paint. I even found black paint on their fingers right after your dad found the smile faces on his cassavas. Okay. Very weird, but lawn gnomes are lawn gnomes, Joe. They don't run around doing mischief. What if we prove them guilty? Excuse me? How would we do that? Catch them in the act. Huh? This is nuts, Joe. Come on, Moose. We'll do it tonight. We'll sneak out, hide around the side of the house, and watch them. No way. I'm in big trouble after last night. And after the police finish, what kind of trouble will you be in then? Okay, okay, I'll do it. But I think this whole thing is a big waste of time. We're gonna trap these gnomes, Moose, if it's the last thing we do. Oh, my alarm clock, it didn't go off. And now it was nearly midnight, and I was late. I grabbed my sneakers and ran outside. The yard was silent, too silent. Joe, Joe, over here, I thought you chickened out. No way, this was my idea. 
Yeah, you're a crazy idea. I can't believe I'm hiding behind a bush in the middle of the night. It's behind on lawn ornaments. I know it sounds crazy, but shh. Did you hear something? I heard it. A scraping sound. I reached into the shrub and parted the sharp green needles and stared through the mass of branches. Two small glowing eyes met mine. Get it, Moose, get it! Moose jumped up from behind the bush just in time to see it scamper away. A raccoon. It was only a raccoon. Sorry, Moose. We've been out here forever. Those gnomes aren't going anywhere. I'm going home. Wait a little longer. We'll catch them. I know we will. You're a pretty good guy. So I hate to tell you this, Joe, but you're as crazy as a... He didn't finish his sentence. His mouth dropped open, and his eyes nearly popped out of his pudgy head. They're moving. They're really moving. Moose tugged me to my feet. We both stared in horror as Hap and Chip limbered up bending their knees, and each taking one stiff step after another. I was right. They were alive, very alive, and coming toward Moose and me. We have to run, I told myself. We have to get out of here. But neither of us could take our eyes off the living lawn gnomes. The gnomes ran closer. I shut my eyes and heard them run past. When I opened my eyes, I saw them racing around the side of the house. Moose, they didn't see us. Where are they going? I don't know, but we have to follow them. Come on. I'm getting out of here now. No, you've got to stay and help me catch them. We have to show our parents what's been going on here. We've got to stop them. But how? Let's tackle them from behind and pin them down. OK, then we'll drag them into the house and show my parents. I took a deep breath and held it. Moose and I started to inch forward, closer. And then I saw Moose go down. The gnomes spun around and fixed their eyes on us. Their faces turned hard and angry. Get them. Don't let them escape. Run! Moose and I bolted toward the front of the house. I could hear the high-pitched giggles of the two gnomes close behind us. Help! Somebody help us! Help! I glanced at the house. Why wasn't anyone waking up in there? We kept running. Why were Hap and Chip giggling like that? I felt Moose tugging me. Don't slow down, Joe. Keep going. <laughs> can't, can't run. Pain in my side. Ugh. Joe, keep going. Don't stop. But I doubled over, folding my side. It's all over, I thought. They've got me. And then the front door swung open. The porch light flashed on. What's going on out here? Mindy stepped out into the yard, pulling at the belt of her pink bathrobe. I saw her squint into the darkness. Mindy! Mindy, watch out! <gasps> Too late! The gnomes grabbed her. They pinned her arms back, dragged her down the porch steps, and carried her into the street. Oh, uh, help me! Eddie, hey, don't just stand there. <laughs> help me! Moose and I didn't say a word. We just started chasing after them. They had already carried Mindy to the street. I saw Mindy struggling to free herself. Put her down! Put my sister down now! The gnomes just kept giggling, scurrying past the McCall's house, then past the next two houses. Moose and I ran after them, shouting, begging them to stop. And then, to our shock, they did. They set Mindy down in the shadow of a tall hedge and turned to us. We mean you no harm. The gnomes' expressions were serious now. Their eyes peered at us through the darkness. I, I, I don't believe this. This is crazy. Crazy! Tell me about it. Please, listen to us. We mean you no harm. No harm? No harm? You just dragged me from my home! You, you... We only wanted to get your attention. Well, you got it. We mean you no harm. Please, believe us. How can we believe you? Look at all the trouble you've caused. You've ruined the gardens. You splash paint everywhere. You... We can't help it. We really can't. 
Issy, we're mischief elves. That was a good one. Thank you. You're welcome. Here, for what? We're mischief elves. We do mischief. That's our mission in life. Wherever there is mischief in the world, we're there. Mischief is our job. We can't help ourselves. Chip bent down and broke off a chunk of the concrete curb. Then he pulled open the mailbox across from us and shoved the piece of concrete inside. You see, we can't help ourselves. We have to do mischief wherever we go. <laughs> Without us, the world would be a pretty dull place, wouldn't it? It would be a much better place. Please don't hurt our feelings. Our life isn't easy. We need your help. You want us to help you do mischief? No way! You've already gotten me into major trouble. No, we need you to help us get our freedom. Please, listen and believe. Yes, listen and believe. We lived in a land far from here. In a forest deep and green, we guarded the mines and protected the trees. We performed our mischief innocently. But we also did a lot of good. Yeah, we were hard-working people, and we were happy in our forest home. But then the mines were closed, and the forests were cut down! We were captured, kidnapped! I love this part! Thank you. And taken far from home. Far from home? We were shipped to your country, and forced to work as... <clears throat> lawn ornaments! Slives! Forced to stand all day and night. By the way, Chip, no shoes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Wait, that's impossible. Don't you get bored? I mean, how do you stand so still? We go into a trance. Time passes without our realizing it. We come out of the trance at night and go about doing our job. You mean mischief? Yep. But we want to be free, to go where we want, to live where we choose. We want to find another forest where we can live in freedom. Will you help us? Help you do what? Help our friends and us escape. There are six of us. They're locked in the basement at the store where you bought us. We need your help to set them free. We can climb into the basement window. But we are too short to climb back out. Yeah. And too short to reach the door. Will you help us escape? You just have to climb down into the basement. And then help our six friends out the basement door. Please help us. Then we'll go to a deep forest and we'll never cause you mischief again. Oh, that sounds good to me. Yeah! So you'll do it! Oh, please, 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 Hey, let's help him. What do you think? Well, look how much Buster hates to be tied up. He only wants to be free. I guess everything deserves to be free, even lawn gnomes. We'll do it. We'll help you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You don't know what this means to us. Hap leaped into the air and clicked the heels of his boots together. Hurry! Let's go! After you, Hap. Oh, no, 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 Chip. After you. No, after you, Hap. Oh, it will be my pleasure. Go right ahead. Now? I I, it's the middle of the night. Can't we you. wait till tomorrow? No, 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 no. no, please, now! In the darkness, while the store is closed. Please, let's hurry! I, I'm not even dressed. I really don't think we can go now. I think... If we stay here longer, we'll have to do more mischief! Let's do it now. And so the five of us crept along the dark street and up the steep hill toward Lawn Lovely. The pink house was a strange enough place during the day, but at night, it was, it was totally creepy. All those lawn animals, deer and seals and flamingos, stared at us through the darkness. Were they alive too? Hap seemed to read my mind. They're only for decoration. Nothing more. Mindy clutched my arm with an ice-cold hand. Hap and Chip pointed to the long, low window that led down to the basement. I knelt down and peered inside. Total darkness. 
You sure the other gnomes are down there? Oh, yes, all six. They're waiting for you to rescue them. Please, Harry, before the old woman hears us and wakes up. I lowered myself to the edge of the open window and turned back to my sister and Moose. We're coming right behind you, Joel. Let's rescue them and get out of here. Here goes. I crossed my fingers and slid down into the darkness. I bumped over the window frame and landed on my feet. A few seconds later, I heard Moose and Mindy slide in after me. I couldn't see a thing. Chip and Hap jumped over the window ledge and thudded to the floor. Hey, guys. But they scampered off into the darkness. What's going on here? We've got to find the light switch. But before we could move, the ceiling lights all flashed on. I blinked in the sudden blaze of brightness and then gasped as I stared across the vast basement at a sea of lawn gnomes. Not six, 600. Row after row of them, jammed against each other, staring at the three of us. Whoa! It's a mob! Hap and Chip lied to us! Their shirts were different colors, but the lawn gnomes looked exactly alike. Hap clapped his hands three times. And then the crowd of gnomes came to life. We've got to get out of here. I glanced up at the basement window. When I turned back, Hap and Chip had moved in front of us. The hundreds of gnomes instantly fell silent. We have brought the young humans! We have kept our promise! The gnomes giggled and cheered. And then the gnomes began moving forward. Mindy, Moose, and I backed up to the wall. The gnomes crowded up against us. Their little hands plucked at my clothes, slapped my face, pulled my hair. Stop! Get back! Get back! Well, we came to help you! Please! We came to help you escape! But we don't want to escape. Now that you're here, it's going to be so much fun! What did he mean by fun? Hap and Chip pushed their way back to the front and stepped up beside us. They clapped their hands together to silence the giggling, chattering crowd. You tricked us! You lied to us! I can't believe you fell for our sad story. We told you we're mischief gnomes. You should have known we were playing mischief. <laughs> Great joke, guys. You fooled us. Way to go. So now let us go home, OK? Yeah, let us go home. The whole room erupted in laughter. Chip turned to the crowd of excited gnomes. So, uh, what shall we do with our lovely prisoners? Any ideas? Let's see if they bounce. Tickle them, tickle them. Tickle, tickle, tickle. I turned to Moose. He stared out at the crowd of chanting gnomes, dazed and frightened. What are we gonna do? Suddenly, I had an idea. I raised my arms high over my head. Quiet! The room instantly grew silent. Hundreds of red eyes glared at me. Let us go or the three of us will scream at the top of our lungs. We will wake up Mrs. Anderson and she will be down here in a second to rescue us. <laughs> You'll have to do better than that. We all know that Mrs. Anderson can't hear a thing. Go ahead and shout. Shout all you want. We like it when humans shout. I turned to my sister and niece. We're doomed. We don't have a chance. I knew there had to be a way out of this basement, but I felt so dazed. My thoughts were a jumbled mess. <laughs> Suddenly, over the shrill gnome's voices, I heard a familiar sound. Buster! I hear him! I, I did too! He followed us! He must be right outside! I desperately wish Buster could talk, but he could only bark. I suddenly remembered how frightened Hap and Chip appeared whenever Buster came around. Maybe Buster can scare them into letting us go. Maybe he can even frighten them back into their trance. Mindy, I 
I think the gnomes are afraid of Buster. If we get him down here, I think he can save us. Come on, Buster! Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Could he hear us over the chanting gnomes? Yes! His big head peered down at us through the window. Down, Buster! Come down here, boy! Come on! Joey, flying down! Do something! No, Buster! Come, boy! Don't lie down! Come, Buster, come! Buster pushed his head back into the window. That a boy! Come on! A little more! Please, Buster, you're our last chance! Please, hurry! Come down here! To my dismay, Buster pulled his head out of the window and trotted away. Hap grinned up at us as the gnomes changed their chant. I held my hands over my ears, trying to block out the sound of their shrill voices. Oh, silence! Please let me have silence! Silence? The word gave me an idea. Silence! Buster's dog whistle was silent. Suddenly, I knew how to bring Buster back. Mindy, the dog whistle. Buster always comes when I blow the dog whistle. That's right. Hurry, Joe. I grab for the shiny metal whistle under my t-shirt. This has to work, I thought to myself. It has to bring Buster back. I pulled the whistle out. It's the whistle! The room instantly grew silent. I raised the whistle to my lips. Quick, blow it! Hap and Chip both dove at me, slapping at the whistle as they leaped. It spun out of my hands. I grabbed frantically for it, but it rolled away, sliding across the floor. No! I dropped to the floor, scrambling for it. A few feet away, Moose struggled against four or five gnomes who had formed the line to block him. Mindy was battling another group of gnomes who held her back. And then I saw Hap raise the whistle high. The gnomes stepped back, clearing a circle around him. Hap set the whistle in front of him on the floor. Then he raised his foot high. He was about to crush it. Oh, no! I scrambled over the floor. As Hap's heavy plaster foot came down, I stretched out my hand, fumbled for the whistle, grabbed it, and rolled away just as the gnome's foot tromped down. It thudded inches from my head. I sat up, raised the whistle to my lips, and blew as hard as I could. I turned to the window as I blew the silent whistle again. Buster, where are you? The gnomes must have been asking the same question because they froze in place. Hey, look at them! Look! They all froze! Mindy pushed a gnome over. It clattered to the floor. It was just a hunk of plaster. I don't get it. Buster never showed up. If they weren't terrified of the dog, why'd they all freeze up again? I suddenly knew the answer. I raised the whistle and blew it again. It was the whistle. It wasn't Buster. I had it wrong. They were afraid of the whistle, not the dog. Let's get out of here. I never want to see another lawn gnome as long as I live. Wait till I tell my parents about this. Whoa, wait. We can't tell anyone about this. No way. Why not? Because no one will believe it. You're right. You, you, you're definitely right. How do we get out of here? I knew how. I picked up Hap and Chip and stood them beneath the window. Then I climbed onto their caps, lifted my hands to the window, and pulled myself up. I thanked them for the boost. Of course, they didn't reply. I could only hope they were frozen for good. Mindy and Moose followed me out. Buster was waiting for us in the yard. Thanks, Bella. Weren't much help, were ya? Yes! We're out! Tickle, tickle, tickle! I made tickling motions with my hands and started to chase Mindy down the street. Joe, stop it! Don't tickle me! I'm warning you! Tickle, tickle, tickle! I knew I'd never forget those chants. I knew I'd hear them in my dreams for a long, long time. The next evening, Mindy and I were watching TV in the den when Dad came home. Mom had warned us earlier to be nice to him. 
He was very upset that someone had stolen his lawn gnomes. When Dad came in, he had a strange expression on his face, and he kept glancing guiltily at Mom. Everyone, I've brought home a little surprise. Now what? Come and see. Dad led us out to the front lawn. The sun was disappearing behind the trees. But I could still see clearly what Dad had brought home from Lawn Lovely. A gorilla, at least eight feet tall, with gigantic black eyes and a bright purple chest. Now that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. You're not really going to put that horrible monster on our front lawn, are you, dear? Oh, I think it's a beauty. The best looking lawn gorilla I ever saw. It's great, Dad. Yeah, much better than those lawn gnomes. Mom just stood there, shaking her head, then hurried back to the house. I glanced up at the gorilla's enormous painted face. Be a good gorilla. Don't be like those awful gnomes. As they all headed inside, I looked back at the gorilla, just in time to see him wink at me. <laughs> Revenge of the Lawn Gnomes by R. L. Stein. Created by Parachute Press and published by Scholastic Incorporated. This audio adaptation was produced and distributed by Walt Disney Records.